Hello and welcome to episode 112 of Do More With Your Money. I am your host, TJ Van Gerven. On today's podcast episode, I'm going to speak to you about how to look at your portfolio from a holistic standpoint. One of the biggest or most common mistakes that I see people do with portfolio construction is they overcomplicate it. So they're focused on kind of the granular aspects of investing, which specific investment, individual stock, how much do I own in large cap, mid cap, small cap, international. And while these things you know, can add value in some regards from an expected return standpoint, maybe making more decisions of growth versus value and small cap versus large cap, ultimately, the largest determinant of your expected return, and we've seen this through years and years of historical data, is how much you own in stocks versus bonds versus cash. Now, you can also start to factor in other assets like real estate. However, if you're talking about real estate as your primary residence, I tend to exclude that from portfolio. Now, if you have real estate as a rental income source and you have multiple rental properties, then you can start to think a little bit more about how much exposure you have to the real estate market. But generally speaking, when I'm thinking about portfolio construction, it's just considering stocks, bonds, cash, because those are the three major asset classes that are going to move differently when put together. So historically, bonds have had somewhat of a negative correlation to stocks. They're different assets. So the bond, it's it's a debt payment where there's a repayment schedule. And they're seen as less risky in some ways in stocks because if something happens, you know, if it depends, if it's a treasury or a corporate bond, but it's a debt payment. So it has a priority over ownership in a company. And so at least historically speaking, this hasn't been the case recently with how fast interest rates have risen. But in the past, if the stock market was doing poorly as a whole, let's say, you know, a 2008 scenario where the market is down, you know, 30, 40 plus percent from its high, bonds are seen as a quote unquote safer investment because a lot of times when you own a bond mutual fund or a bond ETF, that's going to be primarily comprised of U.S. treasuries. And treasuries are seen as, you know, pretty close to risk free from a default standpoint because, you know, we have so much faith in the back in the U.S. government and their ability to generate revenue. Now, obviously, if the U.S. government defaulted on its debt, then that would be a bigger issue. But for the foreseeable future, it appears that the U.S. government is able to pay its debt based on the financial health of the U.S. economy or the um, ability to generate tax revenue. So from a default standpoint, U.S. Treasuries are seen as risk-free. Now, that doesn't mean that they're riskless because there is interest rate risk with owning bonds or U.S. Treasuries because, for example, if you were receiving 3% interest on a 10-year Treasury, let's say, as part of your bond ETF or bond mutual fund, and now interest rates have risen because the Federal Reserve is trying to raise interest rates to combat inflation. And let's say that new 10-year treasuries are issued at 5%. If your bond or treasury is traded on an exchange via an exchange-traded fund or, or again, a mutual fund, then you're going to see a price reduction in the value of that bond to compensate for the fact that new treasuries that are issued are paying a higher interest rate. Why would somebody purchase your bond that you own at 3% interest when they could purchase a new treasury that's that's at 5% interest. So that's a little side tangent on why bonds and treasuries are seen as less risky from a you know default standpoint, especially if it's treasuries, but even if it's a corporate bond, you have priority over a stockholder with, with debt if something were to happen to the company, whereas ownership in a company is lower on that priority list and that's why they're seen as more risky however there is risk in other ways from interest rates and the inverse relationship that has with the value of a bond but back to the overall point of portfolio construction is again there are these three different asset classes so we have stocks bonds and cash so again stocks are going to be seen as more risky in the short term 
because things can happen to the overall economy or the global economy. Obviously, if you're owning individual stocks, the risk is much higher because the range of outcomes is much higher. I think it's important to educate yourself if you are investing in broad-based markets, whether that's the U.S. market or global market as a whole. Historically speaking, what have been some of the worst periods of drawdowns? So, for example, I mentioned 2008. You can look at 2001, dot-com bubble, 1987, flash crash. You can look at Great Depression. Obviously, that's going to be a little bit of an outlier because much different time there. They didn't necessarily have the things in place that we have today as far as kind of like circuit breakers. And, you know, nowadays, if the market is extremely volatile, they will actually halt trading to kind of allow people to take a breath, take a breather and to disincentivize kind of panic selling. And so it is unlikely that you would experience kind of a drawdown of the global market that you experience in kind of Great Depression. And there wasn't really access to the global market back then anyway. So it was really just US market. But the point is, is that you could argue because of the way that the Federal Reserve steps in nowadays that it's unlikely that you could see that level of drawdown. Obviously, anything is possible. But if you look back and educate yourself on the historical moments and how that impact drawdowns, it gives you perspective on, you know, what could happen if you own, let's say, 90% of your investment assets in stocks. And again, when thinking about portfolio construction, this is why it's so important to understand that the majority of your return is going to come down to how much do I own a stock? How much do I own in bond? How much do I own in cash? Now, one of the things that I've advocated for over the years and other podcast episodes is you know, being conservative with your financial planning. And one of the ways you can be conservative with your financial planning is having an appropriate cash reserve. So one thing that's really important from a portfolio construction standpoint is not a big fan of having cash in your investment accounts, right? Your investment accounts, your portfolio should be fully invested in a mixture of assets that makes sense on your appetite for risk, your capacity to take on risk, again, based on what you're trying to accomplish in the future. If you're trying to maximize returns over the long term, then you're going to want to have, you know, a majority of your portfolio in stocks. Because historically, that has been the best way to not only preserve your wealth, but grow your wealth above inflation. You, again, you can look at long-term historical averages for returns in the stock market. Now, you you can argue that it's unlikely that we're going to necessarily have that high of returns over the long term, just because people tend to forget that the reason that the stock market has produced such great returns over long time frames is that there was risk along the way. There was uncertainty. And that's the reason that investors were compensated for investing back then. So, you know, when people say, oh, if you had just invested in Apple or Amazon is a good example, just invested in Amazon since it IPO'd. You, if you invested a thousand dollars, you'd have X amount of dollars today. But what they fail to look at is the drawdowns that Amazon experienced over that time frame. So, Amazon lost ninety percent of its value multiple times over the history of the stock. And so, yes, you would have achieved these great returns, but that came with very, very high volatility. And most people, I would argue, in this extreme example every person that wasn't like Jeff Bezos because he obviously didn't sell his stock, he was materially involved in the company, would not be able to last through those types of drawdowns. And that's why it's important, again, with portfolio construction, when thinking of stocks, bonds, cash, is to understand kind of some of the range of outcomes there. And so you could start to think about, okay, if my portfolio lost you know, 50% of its value, how would I feel? Right. Would I be able to stay invested? Uh, and again, this is why it's important if you are conservative from a planning standpoint, that's going to help you be more aggressive with your portfolio construction. And so cash, you can think about how much cash you have relative to your portfolio, but I would focus on how many months of living expenses do you have in cash? It's going to make you comfortable. That's going to provide you peace of mind to stay invested during volatile market periods so that you can ultimately achieve the returns that the market provides. 
Because again, if you look back historically and look at these volatile periods, 2001, 2008, COVID, if you had stayed invested during these periods over the long term, you still would have generated a return well above inflation and it would have allowed you to grow your money and build towards financial independence. And so it really comes down to discipline and putting your time in. And there are some things that you can do along the way to kind of help boost your returns as far as rebalancing, tax loss harvesting. There are, you know, kind of tips and um, tools of the trade that you can use along the way. But ultimately, how much of your portfolio you have in stocks, bonds, cash is going to determine the primary expected return for you. So how to think about this? Again, most people start to think about, okay, in my 401k, I have this fund. In my Roth IRA, I have this fund or these individual stocks. In my taxable brokerage account, I picked these funds or these individual stocks. They are not looking at the, the collection of all these accounts together. And so, again, you kind of have to go out of your way to use tools to do this. Obviously, you can work with an advisor that should help you aggregate all of your accounts to see this collectively. If you're trying to do it yourself, you can use something like Personal Capital or Mint or Portfolio Visualizer, some free tools online. But what you really want to just understand is across all of my investment accounts, what is the percentage I own of stocks versus bonds versus cash? Then you can really start to get a little bit more granular as far as international versus US. Then you can start to think about large companies versus small companies. Then you can start to think about growth oriented companies versus value oriented companies. But that stuff is really the dessert. That is not the, you know, grains and fruits and vegetables of your portfolio construction. And it's only going to add, you know, basis points on the ultimate return there. What's really going to determine your return is number one, your behavior. Are you staying disciplined to your investment strategy? And number two, the breakdown of stocks versus bonds versus cash. So the takeaway of this podcast episode is when thinking about portfolio construction, do not overcomplicate it with the selection of individual securities, such you know, individual stocks. We kind of want to stay away from individual stocks unless we have, you know, extreme conviction in that and we're keeping it to a percentage of our portfolio that we're comfortable with that if it were to go to zero that we'd be comfortable with. So any kind of speculation when it comes to individual individual stocks, cryptocurrency, I would say, you know, equity compensation to an extent, we want to determine kind of the maximum percentage of our portfolio we're willing to hold in those type of things. And then within our, you know, portfolio, our diversified assets, we're focusing on the percentage of stocks we own, percentage of bonds we own, cash, again, I would think about more from a planning standpoint, having that in kind of like a high yield savings account equivalent to a certain amount of months of living expenses that will make you comfortable. And that'll make it so that you never feel that you need to like sell out of your investment accounts just because we want to avoid those situations where we're at the mercy of the market, right? We want to be able to stay invested during volatile periods. Again, this is why it's important to educate yourself on historical performance. Even in years when the stock market is up, you're still going to experience multiple 10% drawdowns throughout the year. Meaning that even if the market, let's say the S&P 500, for example, finishes the year a positive 15%, it might have been down 15% at one point throughout the year. Like That is statistically, historically, not out of the range of outcomes, like that's very common. And so again, you have to stay invested during those periods because if you try to time the market, get in and out, you risk missing out on the days where you're going to receive the majority of that return. And the days are very random. So it's very, and most days are going to be positive versus negative. So it's unlikely that you're going to just miss the negative days. You're probably going to end up missing the positive days. And so that's why, being more buy and hold inclined typically provides better outcomes over the long term. And again, that comes down to discipline and having a investment strategy, investment policy statement in place. So that's what I have for you today as far as overcomplicating portfolio 
construction. Focus on the high level factors before getting into the granular. Focus on stocks, bonds, cash before thinking about U.S. international, small versus large companies, growth versus value, individual stock selection. That stuff is ancillary to the high level thinking when it comes to portfolio construction. I hope you have a great rest of your week.